Hello, you're listening to 187th special episode of Web Standards Podcast. I'm your host, Vadim McKee from HTML Academy, and today we have a very special guest, good friend of mine, Bruce Lawson. Hello, Bruce, and tell us a bit about yourself. Привет! Hello, everybody. I'm uh, Bruce Lawson, handsome but middle-aged uh, Web Standards guy in the UK, United Kingdom. I'm sitting here. It's a lovely and sunny in my uh, in my large palace, looking out of my garden um, with a small dog sitting on my feet. Uh, Vadim and I go way back. So we were both in the developer relations team at Opera when Opera was a thing. And we've coincided at many conferences and uh, events in the last 10 years. And long may we continue to do so. Yeah, one of the reasons I asked Bruce to join us today is um, interesting fact. Like uh, Last year, I gave a talk uh, called uh, Semantics for, for Cynics. I gave it in Russian a few times and uh, I even gave it once at the Frontiers Jam, Jam session. So I think there should be a video uh, of me trying to speak English uh, at Frontiers. And uh, I also saw Bruce's article uh, published uh, some, some time ago. I think it was December last year. Or, yeah. Something like that. And um, um, it, it surprised me because we were expressing the same ideas and talking about almost the same thing, uh, like semantics uh, in HTML and uh, the reason it still exists and the reasons we should care about it as developers. And I was surprised to see uh, that we shared almost the same ideas and even sometimes even similar pictures from, from Apple presentation. I'm going to ask you first, what was the reason for you to, to write this article? Just to summarize, why do you think it's still important and then I, I share my own view maybe maybe it would be unnecessary because you have the same I, I can tell what you're doing Vadim you're trying to trap me into confessing that I copied your talk and then you're going to sue me for millions I know how it works <laughs> uh, I think it's not surprising that we have uh, similar uh, narrative in our talks given our shared history um, and our shared interests you know in in the open the open web and open to everybody uh, regardless of disability etc insert your Tim Berners-Lee quote of choice here. But also, of course, <laughs> there are great reasons to care about semantics, but there's not actually that many reasons to care about semantics. And thus, I think we were both sort of came, came up with the same five or six reasons, which are accessibility, SEO, future-proofing, so that when a new device like the Apple Watch turns up, um, your site should already work well if you have uh, used correct HTML semantics. But but yeah, I mean, I think 10 years ago, telling everybody to care about semantics was largely ideological. You know, that mm-hmm. it was hard to demonstrate a practical use. That's how I literally started my talk. I showed slides uh, of my talk, like I gave uh, probably 10 years ago or something like this. Uh, and, and I said, yeah, we used to, we used to see HTML5 as a, as a new hope in a Star Wars way, like new hope that something's going to come and save us finally. And then I say it failed us because it restarted the web standardization process. It gave a new boost to it. But then nothing really happened with uh, in, in developers' minds. Nothing really happened for for the web platform in general. So we we we, we stopped caring uh, about semantics uh, short after it, it happened. Like new uh, shiny shiny new HTML five tags, yeah, whatever. We, we still have no idea what's the, what's the difference between section and article. So it wasn't big of an impact from my perspective. So I, well, one of the main ideas of my talk was like you can be cynical about semantics and use it only for practical reasons. Yeah, well, you say um, people stopped caring about semantics. I'm not sure whether that's true. I think the people who never cared continued not to care, and the people who did care continued to care. And as new people came on board, it got a lot easier to persuade them uh, to use semantics. So, for example, the fact that their header element built in the, uh, the, the role of banner so people didn't have to add the extra aria. Mm -hmm. It made it a lot easier to say to people, look, if you just use header, main, and nav, and footer, you're already doing a lot of stuff better without you even having to try. I think the problem was it was that some of the elements are not properly or not adequately specified. You say, you know, what's the difference between section and article? We've been asked that hundreds of times 
on HTML5 Doctor and this conference season, I've been asked it a few times. The answer, by the way, podcast listeners, is just don't use section. Just don't bother using it. It has no no real semantic value, whether as article does. And I think that's because they got dreamed up very early on in the genesis of Web Applications 1.0, which subsequently got renamed HTML5 and subsequently HTML Living Standard. And then they kind of fossilized because I think that the the cool kids who wrote the spec were more interested in groovy JavaScript APIs and not actually that interested in semantic elements to mark up chunks of content. So ignore the section element. The main element is an excellent thing, and Steve Faulkner had to fight quite hard to get that added to the spec. Oh, yeah. I remember it was uh, missing from what WG version for a while. <clears throat> for a long time, because uh, Hixie said there was no use for it. And in fact, to be fair, I said there was no use to it, and Steve Faulkner, luckily Steve Faulkner persuaded me that I was wrong and he was right, and so now I'm an ardent supporter of the main element because, you know, it allows somebody using assistive technologies to hit a button and jump straight to that main content, meaning that you don't have a skip, need to have a skip links uh, link. And to somebody who doesn't need it, then there's no, you know, it doesn't make the experience any different or worse. There's one thing that, that really helped me to understand the meaning of uh, a main element. Once in a while, uh, when, uh, when, when internet is, connection is bad, browser f- fails to load uh, style sheets for, for the page. And sometimes I see page without style. So it takes a few minutes for, for, for browser to, to give up and just show HTML. And sometimes you have to scroll like five, six, seven screens before before you get to the actual content of the page because like navigation, banners, uh, some sidebars and uh, nonsense like this. Everything is that surrounds the actual content of a page. But So when you see it, you start to realize if you would go through this link by link, like paragraph by paragraph, list by list, you wouldn't get to the con- content because you, you would forget what, what, you, what you were looking for. So if you have like at least uh, jump to links or better both main and jump to content links you, you would you would uh, really help because with styles it's all compact it's all hidden somewhere in drop down menus and things like that but when you see it without styles you can actually experience it as uh, assistive technology user would yeah yes and uh, and a little while ago i did uh, a webinar with leonie watson and i asked her to show the viewers how she as a screen reader user navigates navigates and perceives the web. And I asked her to use my website, not because I'm holding it up as an exemplar of uh, of brilliance, uh, but because I didn't want to name and shame anybody. Perfectly happy to name and shame myself. Maybe you can post the link. I edited out the six minutes or something of her on my site showing how header, footer, nav and main practically helps her to navigate it's really interesting to see an, a real live human being actually using the web with a screen reader um, and the difference between a page that's got semantic markup versus a page that doesn't. It really resonates. And I think you have to be a special kind of um, hard-hearted person not to care when you've seen a real human struggling. Oh, yeah. it, it changes uh, the way you think about it. It's not just uh, 1% of users. It's the real people. Exactly. You know, it's, it's easy to forget that uh, there are real human beings operating the browsers who consume our, our content. It's, l- it's like, yeah, like hating IE11 you're not hating machine or software, you're hating actual people. Exactly. And um, you say, no, it's not just 1% of users. 1% doesn't sound very much when you say 1%. But if you think 1% of 7 billion people, that's a yeah. lot of people. Right. So we, we have this like a complete understanding of this accessibility part of things. I think uh, like from, from my perspective, accessibility, uh, it's, it's one of the main reasons. Maybe it's for some people, it's, it's the only reason le- left to, to care about semantics. And I, and I get it. 
So it's it's uh, important enough to to be one of the main reasons to care about semantics. I think it's it's much easier to talk about semantics. I care about it in many ways, uh, and I think it's it's a good thing for for for, for many applications. But uh, I chose this way to explain semantics, uh, the importance of semantics in in HTML uh, via accessibility practice. So uh, that's that's one thing. But uh, what are the others? Other ways of pursuing uh, semantics in HTML, like what, what would be a good reason to do this apart from semantics? Hmm. Well, it's funny because you said you chose to emphasize accessibility. I actually choose to de-emphasize accessibility. I mean, I, I don't keep quiet about it because uh, I have accessibility needs of my own personally, but I find that <laughs> for one reason or another, if accessibility isn't enough of a enough of a draw for the person listening to me. I point out things like the Apple Watch, you know, the fact that I have Mm -hmm. article elements and I have uh, figures and fig caption means that the Apple Watch just apparently shows my site properly. Obviously, I'm not beautiful or rich enough to be allowed to wear an Apple Watch, so I haven't checked it out for myself. But um, (laughs) I I did. (laughs) Does it work okay? Uh, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Well, it's good that I have a friend who's beautiful and rich and uh, is allowed to have an Apple Watch. But uh, but that's good. <clears throat> you know, the, the, the idea that I wrote that markup in 2008 when I was researching how to use HTML5, it was still in spec, uh, very much in specification. And I wanted to see whether the specification made sense to me. And gave feedback to the working group saying, you know, this doesn't adequately define it. I don't know what this is supposed to do, etc. But I wrote that markup 11 years ago. And last year, the new version of watchOS came out. And my site just worked. Who knows what's going to come out in 10 years' time. But I acknowledge that a lot of web uh, developers have no expectation their sites are going to be online in 10 years' time. Or they expect they will, but they don't care because they're contractors. SEO. Everybody cares about SEO. When I'm at a, a, a at a conference and I say, you know, put your hand up if your boss tells you to make sure this website can't be found by Google or Bing or Yandex. <laughs> Nobody puts their hand up. And the schema.org stuff really does help SEO. I think a couple of months ago, Google produced a blog post with actual numbers uh, showing how much extra search traffic and conversions you get if you're using schema.org stuff, whether it be microdata or JSON LD. Yeah, it's it's interesting that you mentioned it because uh, applying uh, schema.org or JSON LD or similar things like that, like RDFA and yeah, would be so much harder uh, for developers than just using uh, semantic HTML elements. Seriously, you have to go through the spec. I mean, serious spec, not as easy to read as, as HTML spec. Uh, you have to find the use case for your information you have on your site and, and try to fit it into categories of schema org. And then you have to put a lot of extra attributes that are not easy to read. So it's much it's much harder to implement than just the HTML tags. Agreed, but it, it generally has a different purpose because you're marking up micro content. I find schema.org pretty easy to read, actually. I don't find the HTML. HTML spec particularly easy to read, and it's not really meant for me. It's meant for yeah. I guess I have more experience with HTML, so it's so it, it looks easier for me. Yeah, uh, but that that will lead us into discussion of uh, HTML five doctor soon. But <clears throat> but I do find schema pretty easy to read. But then of course I'm, my website's a blog, and there is a schema org vag- vocabulary for blog posting, and that's mm-hmm. thus the only one I use. But but what I always say to people: if you're mucking around with your source code in order to add schema org microdata in whatever incarnation or syntax you particularly like, you might as well then add the HTML5 elements while you're doing it. I don't know how many people do, but uh, I think they're they're pretty well used. I think main is quite uh, quite prevalent on the on the web in the wild. 
Yeah, uh, like headings, uh, main elements, and uh, proper picture tags. I mean, I, I'm IMG tags and uh, uh, alt attributes. They really serve uh, additional hints for uh, search engines uh, to parse the content. But uh, I think at some point, uh, Google, Yandex, and other uh, search engines, they kind of gave up on uh, markup and they started to analyze the actual content of, of the page. So they, they're not judging the, uh, the value of your page based on uh, HTML tags only or HTML tags first. I think they uh, take them into account uh, like second or third even. I don't think any of us know the magic, but uh, it seems to me that they all use a mixture of heuristics, a, uh, HTML analysis, schema org if they can find it page rank etc when you have uh, sites like twitter.com built on uh, div soup it's really hard to rely on html tags only so you have to analyze the actual content so these days a, a lot of developers not just misuse html tags they just don't use semantic ones i and and in this situation i think uh, search engines uh, have to fall back on actual content uh, analysis yes and and that uh, that div soup it used to be table soup in the old days but div oh, soup yeah still continues and i think a lot of that is to do with um the the current fashion for monolithic frameworks i'm looking at you react but bruce bruce react is a library oh yeah 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 of course uh <laughs> AMP is a framework now, apparently, but uh, yeah, yeah. The, the trouble is is that there's no reason at all why your nav component that you're getting off the shelf can't be wrapped in a nav element, and it's wrapped, but it, people don't do it, and the trouble is is people are just taking these components off the shelf and using them without really thinking about what the structure of the elements is. Uh, once these components are abstracted away, people spend even less time wondering about the uh, the semantics of them. I had a look recently at some popular libraries. Some of them are dreadful and some of them are really good. Uh, the Tenon UI library, for example, is a fabulous thing. It's full, mm -hmm. full of full of semantics, and I know that the people who wrote it actually tested it with people with uh, assistive technologies and not just screen readers. And it's it's free and open source, whereas React Bootstrap is just div soup. So I know which one I choose. And at some point, when somebody gives me a million pound grant, I'm going to go through and score all the different libraries. Speaking of uh, frameworks and libraries, web components are not library or framework per se, but uh, I think they're kind of a fu future of the web. It's something that's going to happen with us sooner or later. Like we're going to start using web components instead of uh, uh, just uh, including some scripts and libraries and uh, things like that. So I, w I wonder what's the situation? Is there any conflict between uh, custom elements, for example, uh, web components and HTML semantics? Is there a way to combine them and use them together? I think there is, but it's trickier than I would like it to be. It used to be the case that you could extend an existing component. So you could say button is equals my fancy button, and then it would inherit button semantics and the things the browser gives you free from button. But the Apple WebKit people were pretty vehement in their opposition to that. And although I was grumpy at the time, I, I do see their point. The actual number of real-world components that will in extend or inherit HTML are pretty low. But I'm quite excited by the AOM, the Accessibility Object Model, which will allow us to uh, do a lot with web components without having to pollute the market with 28 trillion aria attributes all right so during the initialization they would they would apply all uh not not just uh, add attribute, but they would initialize the actual accessibility tree, not DOM tree, with uh, some additional uh, exactly go goodness. Exactly, I can send you um, a link to uh, Leonie Watson again doing a talk in Singapore or Hong Kong about it. 
Um, but it looks really exciting and it's been, uh, it's actively being developed by, I think, Apple, Google and Microsoft or Firefox, but it's based on a Microsoft proposal. There's some big names involved with the specification. And I, I really like the way this is massively geeky, but I really like the way they specified it into different phases, you know, acknowledging the real world challenges of, of specifying these kind of things. But yes, it means that you'll be able to set what is kind of like ARIA roles, etc., inside the component itself rather than you having to sprout lots of aria on top of your component and re- knowing how to do that and remembering to do that the logic will actually be encapsulated in the component so that therefore when you do grab it off the shelf you really are grabbing something that works and you don't have to add extra stuff because we all know that built in beats bolt on bigly oh yeah and also it's not a web components exclusive thing it's uh, it could be applied to any library or framework so yeah 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 i think there are some initial implementations implementations uh, there is uh, some initial implementation in browser already yeah. so yeah maybe behind flags but but still I hope to see something released probably even this year uh, i would think so and i think that's the uh, you know, the, the next big thing for html i mean there, there, there's new apis etc being added all the time but this is foundational it, it has the potential to make a lot of stuff better quickly so i'm i'm excited by this the the one thing that people are worried about is y- it would be possible for a malicious website to tell whether somebody's using an assistive technology or it's potentially possible well there are already some tricks to to do this by detecting some behavior patterns and things like that so there's there's no really way to hide it i think Uh, like reliable way to hide it. I agree, but luckily the web is full of cleverer people than me, so I'm pretty sure that we can reach a compromise. As always with the the development of the web platform, it's about making sensible compromises. So uh, we were discussing at the beginning uh, the idea in developers' heads and the uh, actual reality of Uh, HTML specs and uh, browser implementations. Uh, there are two of them still, and uh, but it's the, this process is uh, this situation is slowly changing. As far as I understand, W3C spec editors and uh, what WG editors they they found some middle ground and they're willing to merge their specs or what's what's going on there? Yes, I was. Am was not sure of what tense I should use. One of the editors of the HTML 5.3 spec. Um, we had a meeting in Amsterdam last June or July, and we were told that the W3C was effectively going to stop developing HTML, and it would go to the what WG. Meaning, meaning that they're not gonna support their own version, but they're gonna still do some work on. Uh, What WG one, right? Yes, I mean the people who were par- were participating in the W three C spec are now participating in the What WG spec, and I think that the W three C will continue to maintain a uh, snapshot versions. Yeah, and this is good and bad. It's good that we're going to have to uh, a single source of truth for the spec because it was always uh, confusing that there was a W3C spec and a what WG spec, and the two would say different things. Yeah, even, even con- conflict uh, things, not not just uh, slightly different, but sometimes they're... One of the main examples I remember is there's multiple H1 tags uh, on a page, yeah. There were a number of differences. Uh, for example, the W3C spec only allowed one main element per page. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, whereas the WG version allowed multiple versions because you might be swapping them in and out with JavaScript. And I think in W3C version, it's allowed to have multiple mains uh, if they're hidden with hidden attribute or display none, which is basically the same thing. Yeah, and there were things like um, the H group element wasn't in the W3C spec because it doesn't; it's completely useless. There, there are myriad differences, uh, and that reflect the different purposes of the organization 
organization. I mean, the W3C spec showed what was actually implemented. The what WG spec has always been forward looking and some parts of it are, you know, complete descriptions of reality and other parts of it are basically people jamming and riffing on ideas and mm. they're implemented nowhere. And the trouble is if you're a developer and you just want to know what you can use, maybe the what WG spec isn't the best place. That's true. Yeah, and also uh, W3C version was full of uh, interesting uh, comments uh, on accessibility and uh, on implementation for developers. Some uh, usage examples, not just for uh, browser vendors, but for actual developers. And it was the, the main uh, reason for me to prefer W3C version. It's one of the reasons that I agreed to be the editor, or one of the editors for it, along with the uh, Shwetank Dick shit another old colleague of ours because there would be real world examples for for devs pointing out you know accessibility stuff um, mostly driven by steve faulkner hat tip to steve the guy does so much for for accessibility etc and it was I, I know that he tried so many times to get that stuff added to the what wg specification and his pull requests were overlooked etc so i'm cautiously hopeful the the what wg people will start accepting more dev focused uh, examples etc uh, but i do think there's a fundamental difference in what the what wg spec was for and what the w3c spec was for and i worry that they won't have uh, i worry that people will think that stuff that is super super nascent is actually in browsers, and I worry that people won't get the advantages of Steve et al.'s accessibility advice. Mm -hmm. But um, they haven't made me king of the internet yet, so my worry is uh, just a formless worry that I can do nothing about. Uh, is it something that's happening already, or it's just a plan for, 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 for specs to, well, not, not to merge, but to move uh, development into uh, what WG? It's happened already. It's already happened. So basically, if you're a developer and Bruce Bruce Lawson's advice to use what WG version now, or it's not quite there yet. Personally, I would use and I do use both because they haven't diverged any more than they were already different. And there's valuable advice in the W3C version of the spec, which I hope will be merged into the what WG spec but uh yeah html 5.3 is never going to be a candidate recommendation there was talk about publishing it as a, a w3c note but that's you know that's just uh how oh, so you're you're saying that uh html 5.2 would be the last uh recommendation I don't know whether the snapshotted versions of the w3c of the what wg spec will be recommendations in the future i just don't well, know enough right. about the, the the process i've always found w3c process to be somewhat uh opaque it's it's not that it's super important for developers to understand what is a recommendation what's not because like these days we mostly rely on browser implementations because that's what users use well, that, that's the main reason for us to care but w3c version was the was the, my my favorite for for many years so it's uh, i got used to it so much so it's it's much harder for me to read what wg version because like of this of the design of the navigation but i think i'll i'll have to deal with it yeah i think so so uh, you mentioned already uh, HTML5 Doctor project. It used to be a very valuable source of wisdom for me because we, we used to translate uh, articles uh, in a web standards community. Like we used we used to have uh, articles like B and I element or figure and fig caption element translated to to, to Russian from from uh, HTML5 Doctor and many many others. I think we have like five to six articles translated uh, or maybe even more. But there are kind of um, I wouldn't say outdated, but they are forgotten. I would say uh, because. No one's really, no one, no one cares what's the difference between strong and B anymore. And uh, just like I said in my uh, semantics for cynics talk, there's no real use in uh, 
distinguishing between uh, B and strong elements in your source code because actual browsers, actual screen readers, they don't care. They don't have a way to tell if it's B or strong. It, they probably a bit a bit outdated. Where where, where is it now? Or what's what's the place of HTML5 Doctor site uh, website these days? Is it is it still valuable? I don't know. Uh, I mean, it started off like I mentioned earlier in 2008, maybe 2009. I can't remember. But uh, instead of doing real work for Opera, I was forcing my WordPress uh, templates to use HTML5 and and tweeting about it and blogging about it. And I think that was quite valuable because it allowed me to say to the authors, you know, I'm a real developer and I'm trying to work out the difference between these tags and there's not enough in the spec to help me decide and they would go through and tweak the spec. And um, I I think it was a future of web apps or future of web design, can't remember which conference it was. And I just said, you know, on Twitter, anybody want to meet up and have a chat about HTML5? Let's do so. And a group of us who'd been talking on Twitter but had never actually met in real life, I uh, went to the pub and we decided to make HTML5 Doctor to be a resource that wasn't in spec language about HTML5. We did it. It was pretty good. A lot of people came to visit it. Um, and as happens... People got married and had kids. People got jobs. I moved jobs and didn't have the time to maintain it. Uh, And crucially, better alternative documentation turned up on the web. And it seemed like there was no real reason to continue writing the HMR5 Doctor stuff. Mm -hmm. So when it went down last week... I was on on holiday, so I didn't pay much attention. I, I, I sort of said, well, you know, is it time to... Is it time to take it offline? I think what we'll do, if Richard, who actually does the hosting, uh, agrees, is we'll probably turn off all the comments because there were trillions of spam comments because of WordPress blog and just keep it alive a bit like um, the webstandardsproject.org is still alive even though Mm -hmm. we're doing nothing more because it it is part of the history of the web. It's not a major part, but it is, you know, a little bit. Future archaeologists might care about it. We still uh, link to HTML5 Doctor articles uh, from HTML uh, Academy uh, courses. So uh, it would be good if it will be online and uh, with the same link structure. Uh, the the thing what I um, what I did with some projects from ten or fifteen years ago, they were most of them they were based on uh, WordPress. So what I did, I took a static uh, copy of everything that I have, like by wget or like curl or whatever script I used uh, to to get all the content from the site. So uh, instead of uh, running the whole WordPress with uh, uh, database and PHP and everything, I just took a, a static snapshot of, 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 of the site. I checked all the links. So everything was intact. I turned off comments because, like, there was there was no use for it because it's like no, no one's answering questions and everything. So uh, it's much reliable to have site website like this, and it's much more cheaper to host because you don't have to enable uh, like uh, database and uh, PHP support. So it could be it could cost you like nothing to to host static website. So that's that's my recommendation for you. Oddly enough, I was looking at that. I was chatting to Phil Hawksworth, who is one of the Netlify DevRel people, about another project. But uh, there are plugins now to WordPress where basically it will just vomit out, as you say, a, a flat HTML file. Oh, yeah. With all the link structures intact. And then you can just port that over to Netlify. They'll host it for three beans and a cigarette, and, and and there's no attack surface because there's no database running. There's no code running. It's just a static yeah, yeah. version. They just point the DNS servers to the Netlify domain. So I'm going to suggest to the boys that we do that with HTML5 the, Doctor. The problem with Netlify, though, that it wouldn't be available in Russia. <laughs> 
seriously, we have a serious problems with Netlify. Like my my whole Twitter timeline is full of people like screaming and uh, crying over Netlify. Like, oh, it's the best thing that ever happened to the web, and it's so easier to 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 use it than any other hosting solutions. But it's just most of the sites hosted on Netlify are blocked in Russia because of their their IPs are blocked for some reason by by a Russian government. Probably an accident. E- yeah, it it's an accident. Well, it's, it was an accident because they were trying to block a Telegram messenger and, uh, and it was uh, hosting some parts of it on, on, on Netlify. So they, they blocked the whole uh, range of IP addresses. I'm just uh, telling you that uh, hosting something on Netlify these days, it's like losing the audience from Russia at all, mostly. I had no idea that, that, that Netlify was blocked in Russia. So yeah, that might be tricky. So uh, as, a, as a static uh, copy of HTML, Five Doctor is a good idea, but hosting on, on Netlify, I don't know. I don't know. Wow, I, I suppose I'd better better move my Pussy Riot appreciation site <laughs> off Netlify then. <laughs> yeah, it's it would be good to ha- to have it available in Russia as well. All right, so uh, I hope I hope you'll find a, the easier way to host it, just for history's sake. But yeah, I, I don't like taking things off the web because who knows what will be of interest to future archaeologists. Uh, so we'll we'll get that sorted out with my right. c- copious free time. Okay, back to what you're doing these days. Like you, you used to work for a Smashing Magazine, but uh, you left. And uh, what's happening in your life? What's your current projects? I think I, I heard something about Prince XML and some others. I'm back in back as a consultant, so I'm doing some work for How Come William Lee on Prince XML. Part time, not full time. Uh, for those who don't know, Prince XML is a piece of software, very old, very mature, 17 years old, that will allow you to make a PDF from HTML, CSS, and SVG. We're engaged, and we've been engaged in an exercise in preparation for Prince 13 to come out to allow developers to have more control over the mapping between HTML semantics and PDF semantics. Because maybe not many people know it, but PDF has its own semantics that uh, allow people with assistive technologies to navigate around PDFs. Oh, really? But Because... Uh... Most of the PDFs on the web, well, well, not most of them, but many of them are just basically JPEGs in PDF container. So they, I guess they're not marked up properly. But if you convert something like even Keynote or HTML page into PDF, it's much lighter than uh, images of the same content would be, and it's accessible at the same time. It's accessible if you have reasonably accessible source, like like anything else. If the source is well marked up, it can then be translated into PDF accessibility. There are multiple good reasons why inaccessible PDFs live. You know, if you're just preparing something to be printed, it doesn't need to be accessible. But Uh, A lot of governments, a lot of big organizations, for various reasons, offer their content as PDF. Therefore, it should be accessible. Therefore, it should be tagged. And Prince, in my opinion, has the best tagged PDF output. On the Mac, the Prince runs on the command line. You just do Prince, mylovelypage.html, dash, dash. And then you give the PDF uh, profile that you want. You probably want the UA one, the universal accessibility one. And that will produce you uh, an accessible tagged PDF that meets WCAG, which is good because WCAG also applies to PDFs that are delivered over the web. It'll do things like uh, take your HTML lang equals RU and apply the RU language to the PDF, not translate it, but mark it as thus so that uh, the end user knows what language the PDF's in. It adds all the structural PDF tags uh, and it's really cool. Yeah, I used to, I used to use prints for or printing uh, shower presentations back in uh, five years ago, or maybe maybe even more. Actually, uh, uh, Hokan, uh, inventor of CSS and 
CEO of Opera. Maybe he's still What's no, he's he's he's, he's not with Opera anymore. So he actually influenced uh, me in a way that I started this uh, shower project because they they used to be this opera opera show or opera present presentation. What was the format? Opera show, yeah. Opera show, yeah. So I thought, yeah, I'll just uh, make my own presentation using opera show, and I did. And then I thought, now I think I need this and that, and then I, and I then I developed shower, and then. Uh, since then, since 2009 or even, yeah, maybe since 2010, I'm still developing this presentation engine. There, there used to be uh, a need for PDF expert of my presentation. Like back in 2010, I think it was a common thing to do for, for uh, conference organizers to request PDF mm -hmm. from, from speakers. I think they, they, they still do th these things, but uh, as as conference organizer, I, I accept HTML presentations as, as well as a source. Not I'm not asking to, to expert everything into PDF. I tried different solutions back then and then I, I realized that Prince uh, is, the, is, is the best uh, spec compatible and uh, uh, the most convenient tool to export uh, HTML and CSS into, into PDF. But then I, 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 I struggled with some problems with compatibility because what, what do you expect when you, uh, when you develop, when you create a presentation or basically anything for, for a browser? You expect this PDF engine to have the same level of support, the same number of features and even bugs in their source code or like similar, uh, and you expect the same result. But Prince used to be behind some technologies because I I remember like uh, there was there was no Flexbox implementation back then and not sure about the Grids implementation these days uh, in in Prince XML and some others like I remember were not not being able to create uh, lines using gradients because there was there was no way to to have a transparent transparent color in, in background in prints for for a while so little little details and these days there's a script command line utility called shower so we, you can type shower pdf and then it will it will print your presentation into PDF using Puppeteer, basically Chromium uh, with some uh, extra APIs around it. So that's what I use myself, and that's what I recommend uh, for developers to use. And uh, the funny thing with with printing because it's it's not number one priority for browsers for everyone really. I think Chromium and Prince, well, I wouldn't call Prince a browser, but uh, Chromium and Prince there are two engines. For, for HTML and CSS uh, that support uh, at page uh, for specifying page size. Uh, there's no way to specify page size in, in uh, Safari, Firefox, Edge, anywhere. Only in uh, Chrome and uh, Prince. So there's no way for you to, to, to properly print something unless you use uh, Chromium or Prince. That's, that's so funny. It is strange, isn't it? Um... And uh, I mean, I know myself, I can't remember the last time I tweaked my print style sheet on my, my website because I don't tend to print stuff out. I don't have printer at home, so... Whoa, you so, you so 21st century. I, I do have a printer, but uh, it doesn't get used a great. It gets used as a scanner more than anything. But um, there are still legions of use cases for printing out from the web. Go going back to what you said about prints, uh, Flexbox is there now, CSS Green. Grid is coming in a version. I'm not sure if it's in version 13, depending. I haven't looked at the roadmap for a couple of weeks. I, I used to work for the, the quasi-governmental organization that regulates lawyers in the UK. And for various reasons, every page of the website had a print this as PDF to save it. A lot of more traditional organizations use dated PDFs I mean, dated as in time and date stamped rather than dated as in archaic. As reference, you know, this is what the rules were on this day. Uh, and that thing becomes a legal term of art, which is an important use case. Websites producing invoices, boarding passes, receipts, restaurant menus. 
and printing books is uh, a significant use case for for prints. Yeah, I have uh, uh, Leah Veru's book CSS Secrets. The the source of it is in in, in uh, HTML and CSS. Maybe I, uh, I also I also have your uh, your and Remy's book uh, HTML5. Maybe it was also uh, originated in HTML CSS. We wanted it to, but uh, the publisher went absolutely not. Microsoft Word. Yeah, classics. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I had to I had to relearn how to use Microsoft Word for that one. Yeah, I mean Halcom's first book about CSS was written in HTML and CSS. And one of the use cases of prints, which I need to write an article about after I write the one about prints on Amazon Web Services. Um is the extra, I think it was GCPM, Generated Content for Paged Media uh, specs that Halcom wrote for uh, CSS. Uh, They're not in browsers per se, but they are, a lot of that stuff's in print, so it allows you to add the the extra things that books have. You know, like uh, if, for example, you were printing a dictionary, probably in the top outside margin top of each page you would have the first and the last word that's defined on this page so people can leaf through it and find it quickly oh really that that sort of thing um is specifiable in prints using well a css extension basically uh-huh. a vendor prefixed css used to be uh, heavily influenced by printing what they have in printing and uh, these days it's not anymore, and it probably makes sense. <laughs> yeah, but there's a, a lot of people who do need to print from from the web, and if you're going to make a PDF, make it accessible, kids. Yeah, 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 that's true. While we're talking, I was I was going through uh, Prince uh, Roadmap, and I see it, there's many things going on, and I, I, I was wondering if it's like written from scratch, or if you're writing it as an independent engine, taking some source code from some other open source browsers. I have no idea how this works, so maybe you'd copy some code from Chromium Project, I don't know. I asked them because I was thinking Thinking about adding it to can I use uh, it is its own implementation it's not WebKit it's not Chromium it's not Gecko it is an independent implementation of the specs and this is amazing because there are no many independent implementations out there it's good to have one more uh, and uh, it's sad that it's not listed anywhere it's not widely known that it's that there is an implementation of uh, modern specs but not for browsing but for printing yeah i, I contacted the uh, alex alexis alex deviria i think who runs can i use and asked if we could list it there but he said entirely legitimately if we start adding things that are not traditional browsers, there are a heck of a lot of different things which would have uh, equal claims to be listed there and make the mm-hmm. site just unwieldy. And I, I acknowledge that browsers are, is the main use case. Um, but I'm, I'm probably going to add a can I use like easy glance at what specs are supported and what specs aren't. It's all documented, but who reads these days? I heard that in uh, science, uh, those serious and smart people, they still use PDF uh, a lot for scientific magazines and uh, for sharing their papers and uh, things like that. So one of the main reasons they still uh, do this because uh, not every way of expressing scientific meanings is supported on the web. Uh, for example, MathML. Uh, there's, there's no way uh, to, to use MathML freely on, on the web uh, these days. And I heard that who's working on this? It was Egalia and uh, I think they're implementing it in, in, in Chromium. Yes, a friend of mine, Brian Cardell, he's um, an Egalia DevRel, and he's working on MathML. I never, ever see mathematics papers because I I can barely count. It's the same here. But there's a huge community of people who need to be able to express their equations, etc., over the web. And yes, they're using PDF because you simply can't put those on the web. It's weird because there used to be a really good implementation of MathML in Chromium, but then they took it 
checked out. One of the co-hosts of this podcast, uh, Maria, uh, she is a mathematician herself. And uh, she gave a talk last year in Kiev, uh, something about math, ML, uh, math on, on the web. And uh, she said that math is the language of the universe. And this is one of the big reasons for Chromium and other brothers to support it. <laughs> That's very poetic. Math is the language of the universe. She's obviously a confirmed Pythagorean. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I wonder if you're going to support MathML uh, and expand uh, the usage of prints for scientific community, for example. Well, I can't answer that, but I will, when I'm uh, having a meeting with them, I will recommend they support MathML because that's one of the things I'm doing is... Uh, recommending stuff for them to do but uh i can't make that promise because i have no power to make it happen but i will be recommending it apart from prince xml what what's going on in your life well oddly enough only this morning chum of mine in south africa adrian hope bailey has submitted to the web incubator community group an explainer that he and i have been working on for a new browser api called web monetization and i'm really really hopeful that this takes off because what we want to do is kickstart basically a new revenue model uh, i have an idea what web payment api is like it's mm -hmm. the way to request basically it's a payment request api API. So you request payment. It's it's in the name. But what's web monetization? Well, web payments are for discrete payments, you know, like $10 for a CD or 100 rubles for uh, this Pussy Riot album or whatever. Web monetization is streaming tiny amounts of money. The unit is nano dollars, but streaming it constantly to a website. I have no idea how one could stream money. <laughs> no, really, it sounds complicated. Uh, there is a, a payment provider. I'm consulting for Coil.com, who are a payment provider. Uh, their business model, every payment provider can make their own business model. Coil's okay. business model is you pay $5 a month to them. And they will stream money to any monetized website that you visit on your behalf. Uh, and if you visit, if they pay more than five bucks, that's fine. They don't take any more from you. It's a five bucks all you can eat model. And if you are a webmaster and you want to monetize your website, you will go to your bank or your digital wallet or whatever and ask for a payment pointer, which, uh, looks it's got a dollar in front of it so it's obvious it's about money uh and it resolves to an https url which is your wallet but uh it's safe to share and it is human readable so you can you know read it over the phone to somebody that was part of the design you add a meta tag uh meta name equals monetization content equals your payment pointer and then anybody who comes to you, your site with at the moment it's a firefox or chromium extension the coil.com extension but we're proposing that it be an open standard so that it can be a whole ecosystem of different payment providers and you will get money coming into your wallet simple as that so you're basically this coil uh, company replaces what like a payment provider like a paypal no they uh, it, it's precisely not to replace anything it's to make a new ecosystem for people to get paid because the trouble is with the web is number one we trained people to believe content should be free and then we polluted the web with advertising to support uh, content creation exactly uh, and you'll remember vadim that we worked for opera which was the first browser to have a built-in ad blocker and i i used to get emails from people hating on us saying you know I earned a thousand dollars a week, a month from ads on my website, you know, when I live in Croatia or, or Belarus and that basically paid for my life. And now you've cut off my revenue stream. And I always felt guilty because I used to have ads yeah. on my site before I joined Opera. So, so this is an attempt to allow people to monetize creating content without having to have massive, heavy, intrusive 
uh, surveillance capitalist ads all over their site. I'm a communist in a way. <laughs> I mean, I don't have any ads on projects I run. I believe in this thing. I don't advertise anything. But for a web standards project, we have sort of, how would you call it, like native ads. Basically, we invite some guests to join our podcast and tell something interesting. And uh, that's the way for them to tell their story and uh, something interesting. It's the way for for listeners to, to hear some interesting stories. Also, we have a Patreon page and we're, we have some income that we spend on uh, equipment and some stickers and uh, some prizes for our uh, patrons. So we, we're trying to monetize our project that's free for everyone with uh, some tools like that. And I wonder if projects like uh, Web Standards uh, Community and uh, like that, it's a target audience for, for this uh, SPAC and uh, company. Absolutely is, because this would supplement your Patreon and your sponsored content, if you like. And, and, and I, I don't see that kind of stuff as advertising. I mean, you're lucky that you have a community big enough where people would want to give you money to... Uh, come and talk about relevant projects to a relevant audience who won't be turned off and bored. Uh, I'm thinking about not just web developers, but I'm thinking about the huge long tail of the web that, you know, probably you and I never see, the the women who write parenting blog posts or people who write about medical issues. I'm thinking about the forum that I used when I first got diagnosed with MS. These are things that don't attract corporate sponsors. So people are reduced to horrible ad farm. I mean, when I had ads on my, on brucelawson.co.uk before I joined Opera, it was because in 2003, 2004, when I started my, my website, web hosting was much more expensive than it is now even though it's uh, 16 years later. And I had two young children, a low salary, and hosting was a non-trivial amount of money. And the ads paid for that. It wasn't like I was, uh, you know, sitting in jacuzzis full of champagne with supermodels on the money. It just meant that I was giving up my time to maintain a web standards blog, but I wasn't actually out of pocket as well. And you've got the same thing, I think, with your projects. Uh, and it's nice to be able to do that without ads. Native ads are fine, but you know, the, the, the horrible malignant things that track you all over the internet uh, and potentially give you malware. I, I'm glad we blocked those at Opera and I wish they would go away. So web monetization is, is, a, is an attempt to provide a different revenue model. And that's why we're making, we're posing it as an open standard because we really want companies to compete against Coil offering different business models because we want this to be a way of content creators to monetize their sites without uh, ads, etc. But uh, so far, how was the feedback on your proposal? I wonder if there are any other companies or spec editors or web standards community members uh, interested? Feedback, uh, I don't know, because it went live 30 minutes before we started this conversation. And, uh, <laughs> and I haven't, <laughs> obviously, I'm, I'm not rude enough that I'd be looking at something else while is it published as a recommendation yet? <laughs> just, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, a proposal. It's in enough shape that it's open for discussion because we, we obviously will change it with community feedback. I know a couple of the browser vendors are interested. I know there's a lot of content creators that we've spoken to who are interested. Um, and I shall be persuading friends of mine to put this meta tag in there in their uh, their head so uh, they can get monetized up. We'll be glad to be one of the first uh, users of this meta tag and uh, mechanism. <clears throat> Groovy and any feedback you have on it, we, we designed it to be as easy as possible. You know, it's a one line that you add to your head. It's a bit trickier to monetize things on YouTube and SoundCloud, etc. Because, uh -huh. of course, not everybody makes written content in HTML. We're figuring that out. But yes, yeah, so, so that's my humble wish at the moment to make a brand new revenue model for content creators because those are the people who've been writing all the fabulous stuff that we've been consuming and learning from for free for the last 15 years. Oh wow, Bruce Lawson saying a revenue model. 
<laughs> yeah, we're going to leverage it to synergize uh, at the ARPU or something. Oh, yeah. <laughs> now I have to go and wash my mouth out with bleach. <laughs> Uh, what else is uh, going on in your in your life and your work? Doing a little bit of consultancy with my good friends in Wix, a couple of hours sanity checking every week with them, and working on a secret hush hush project with the uh, the flame haired Foss love god Stuart Langridge called Sword Cello. Sword Cello, really? Yeah, and and he would kill me tomorrow when we go out for our weekly meeting stroke beer if I uh, gave any details about it. Okay, so we'll see, we'll see. But the name is is cool. The name is cool, and if you go to swordcello.com, you'll hear that I've already made some introductory music based upon the classic zombo.com because we, I needed to buy the domain name, and it's it just saddens me to have a domain name with nothing on it. If you're going to have some content, you need a you need a song, don't you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 that's true. That's that's typical Bruce Lawson. That's, that's typical. Yeah, yeah. I might be. I might grow older, but I don't grow up. <laughs> <laughs> you were listening to 187th special episode of Web Standard Podcast. Thank you for joining us today, Bruce. Rock and roll and Web Standards. Thank you for listening. See you next week in the regular Russian speaking podcast. Cheers. Bye.